Good evening and welcome to Environmental Health Science 660. Um, we are picking up on our uh, first video tonight, uh, September the 17th, and we are going to start by completing the remainder of our third lecture, which was on climate change. And tonight we're going to focus on climate change and energy policy. And we're going to pick up on the last 26 slides in lecture three that we started on the third lecture on September the 10th. So we'll begin with this first slide, which is a, a slide of our historical use of energy in the U.S. And we're going to start by looking at the energy use in the uh, back in the 1850s. And as you can see, early on in the 1850s, a majority of our energy consumption was based on wood, a little bit of coal with the introduction of the steam engine. By the 1900 turn of the century, we had seen that coal had pretty well supplanted wood as our major energy source. And with the advent of the airplane and automobile, petroleum had come on scene. By the 1950s, at the end of World War II, we see that petroleum consumption had rivaled that of coal and coal production had fallen as petroleum became more popular. The associated oils that are used for heat and other energy sources. By the 1960s, we see the arisal of natural gas as an alternative energy source, um, as it was discovered that the natural gas that we used to randomly burn as a waste product during the refining of oil, we realized that we could actually capture that gas and sell it as an energy source. By the 1980s, we see that natural gas, petroleum, and coal are our three very basic cornerstones of our energy policy in the U.S. By the 1990s, we see that today, uh, and, and pretty much today, uh, a mixture of coal, about 27%, petroleum, 39%, natural gas, 21%. So those three sources account for um, uh, almost 85 to 90% of our total energy production, um, over 80%. Uh, with 8% nuclear and 5% hydroelectric, and renewables are less than 1%. So, as you see today, natural gas, petroleum, and uh, coal are all CO2 emitters and add to climate change. This next slide just basically illustrates U.S. energy production in terms of electricity. And as you can see, this is not total energy consumption, but this is energy production for electricity. And as you can see, uh, nuclear accounts for about 19%, uh, coal about 56%, uh, petroleum uh, approximately 5.5%, natural gas about 10%, then hydroelectric power about 2%. So as you can see, uh, we have seen a dramatic uh, change uh, from the 1980s to the 1995, 1985, 1995, in terms of this type of uh, change in production. Uh, so we uh, primarily electricity, uh, when we look at it today, it's still the, the big three, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Now this next slide really begins to talk about the three primary ways in which we use energy. Um, we mentioned the slide previous to this, the uh, way in which we make electricity, which is one of those three ways. The other two ways are the burning of fossil fuels for heat at home, schools and factories and places of business. Um, so that is so home heating is one way we, you know, we use uh, energy. Uh, conversion of heat energy into work, that is driving a motor powered vehicle, whether it's a car, truck, train, or a plane. Uh, and the efficiency here is about 20 to 25% of the energy is transformed and able to do work. 75 to 80% is lost as heat. Then finally, we have the uh, combustion of fossil fuels or the fission of uranium into making electricity. Uh, for petroleum or coal, it's about a 40% energy transformation, 60% losses heat. For nuclear, it's 30 to 32% uh, 
uh, transformed as energy and 68 to 70% lost as heat. So as you can see in our natural systems with 10% efficiency on average up to 20% um, as an optimum, uh, most of our energy uh, conversion sort of followed these same basic laws of thermodynamics that we see in natural systems, although we're able to achieve slightly higher efficiencies for certain technologies. Now this next slide talks a little bit about, you know, making that point in natural systems we see 10 to 20 percent with 80 to 90 percent lost as heat uh, during respiration, just to kind of re reaffirm what I just said. Now this next slide really compares um, natural versus artificial systems in terms of overall energy efficiency. In a natural system, photosynthesis exceeds respiration. Because of that, these systems produce CO2 and consume CO2. They're able to transform solar energy and they're capable of self-maintenance and are renewable. That should not say it is not renewable. That is, natural systems uh, can be renewed uh, with incoming solar radiation. On the other hand, artificial systems, respiration exceeds photosynthesis. Because of that, there's a net consumption of oxygen um, and it produces uh, CO2 uh, as a byproduct. Thus, it consumes energy uh, sources uh, other than other than the sun and is incapable of self-maintenance and is not renewable. Thus when we take a look at a you know a natural system like a forest, it is self-maintaining. Artificial systems on the other hand are not. For example, if you have a garbage strike within a city, there are no decomposers to take care of all the garbage. In a natural system, we're constantly turning over waste products uh, and, and the system is uh, renewable and self-maintaining. Now, another factor that we have to look at in terms of uh, energy uh, in the U.S. today, um, the average energy consumption in the U.S. is about 1,000 BTUs per household. And the average energy expended in an eight-hour workday is about 4,000 BTUs. This means that each household has the energy equivalent of about 250 servants each day to improve the quality of our life. If we divide a million BTUs by 4,000, that comes out to 250 energy equivalent servants. Uh, and those are basically the creature comforts we enjoy in our home. The air conditioning, the running water, uh, the lights that come on, uh, all those amenities that we enjoy. Here's an example of some of those creature comforts that we enjoy. You'll see, for example, in the 1950s through the 1970s, the rapid growth of the electrical appliances such as the electric stove and dishwasher. You'll notice air conditioning. For example, in the 1960s, 50s or 60s, we had less than 12, 13 percent of all households had air conditioning. Today that number is probably, at least in southeast U.S., is probably closer to 95 percent. So as you can really see, uh, much greater energy consumption uh, in the in growth uh, with these. These are the examples of those servants, that energy equivalent servants that we have around your house. You don't have to wash the dishes. You don't have to heat water to take a bath. You don't you don't have to go cut firewood to burn and cook your food. Uh, we, we have all those free creature comforts here every day. If you go and look around the world, like in a country like Zaire, the average woman there may spend four to five hours a day just carrying a clay pot on her head to get drinking water for a family. We can turn on a faucet and we take it for granted, all those natural creature comforts that we have, which defines our, our standard of living and our quality of life. This next slide really talks a little bit about our current availability of fossil fuels like petroleum. Um, the United States does not have large energy reserves of, 
petroleum and our current reserves that are known uh, will be depleted, we estimate, within the next hundred years. As a result of not having some significant quantities of um, energy re petroleum reserves, one of the things we have done in our energy policy is to essentially import oil. We import about 36% of our oil using about two-thirds of our oil from domestic production. This extends our current energy supplies um, and on average we use over 5.7 billion barrels per year uh, which represents 30% of the world's energy supply yet we do not have a, a large portion of the you know, world's population. The real question is the world population continues to grow and double in size every 50 years. Will we still be able to use 30% of the world's available petroleum? As more countries discover the automobile, countries like China with very large population centers, large numbers of people, will we still see as they raise their standard of living that we'll be able to use that much oil? Um, I think that that will be something we will see in the next hundred years, how that plays out. This is a little slide we call the fuel gauge, and this really is designed just to tell us a little bit about um, uh, energy use in the U.S. The first gas station opened in, 1990, uh, in 1905 uh, as the automobile was discovered. In 1946, we see that gas demand had risen by 25% after, after World War II. Um, and we see that we have had declines in gas production upon occasion, particularly in 1952 uh, because of an economic uh, situation in 1974 during the era of oil embargo. You'll notice in 1975 we adopted the first fuel efficiency uh, standards for cars of 13 miles per gallon. Uh, and. Uh, we have continued to try to increase those standards over time to get more energy efficient cars. In 1978, Energy Tax Act provided subsidies to farmers to produce corn and for ethanol and other grains. Um, in 1990, we see a real landmark. This is the introduction of, of uh, SUVs and like the Florida, Florida Explorer, which are exempt from fuel economy standards. And that was a huge mistake because they became one of the largest parts of the uh, transportation system uh, among consumers. In 2004, our fuel economy standards dropped to only 19 miles per gallon uh, with a Congress that was not really progressive in demanding that we continue to increase energy efficiency. Fortunately, President Obama is really trying to do something to reverse this and to drive energy uh, consumption uh, or energy efficiency up in cars as he would like to see a 45 mile per gallon uh, standard uh, and with hybrid technology we that is within our grasp and the size and efficiency of, of uh, hybrids continues to improve in 2007 another landmark year Congress mandated more use of ethanol up to nine billion gallons a year in 2009, rising fourfold by 2022 to 36 billion gallons. So much of the fuels you see today are blended petroleum and ethanol. And what this means is if 10% of our gasoline is ethanol, that means we're not having to import as much oil. So um, anyway, these are just some sort of stops along the highway when we look at energy policy on petroleum. Now this next slide really illustrates what we have in terms of proven reserves for petroleum as opposed to undiscovered reserves. Right now the largest known reserves are in the Middle East and if you ever think the reason so much attention is focused on political stability in the Middle East um, is because of petroleum. Um, because that the stability in oil prices really drives the world economy because so much energy, uh, so much of business and energy is intertwined in terms of use of petroleum. Um, the Middle East accounts for 57% of all known reserves. 
you'll see the U.S. and, and Canadian and Mexican reserves in North America account for about 12 percent, USSR and China about 12 percent, and then the remainder of the reserves are found in other parts of the world. You'll notice particularly the low amounts of petroleum in Europe. Um, if we look at undiscovered reserves, though, it's interesting. The Middle East is is not much greater than the pro projected reserves that we'll find here in North America. Uh, and uh, so the United States, uh, in particular Canada and, and Mexico, particularly the Mexican oil fields, and the North Slopes in Alaska and the Arctic may hold very large reserve potentials for future petroleum. Again, looking ahead to the future, you'll notice Europe does not have large reserves, nor does Africa. Now this next slide is just to sort of talk a little bit about one of the reasons why we consume so much petroleum is gas, even at $4 a gallon, is a bargain. When I was growing up in the 1970s, gas was 36 cents a gallon and fuel mileage economy was around 12, 13 miles per gallon, as we just said. So if you divide 36 cents a gallon by 12 miles per gallon, that meant it cost three cents per mile to drive a car. In 2012, with the price of gas at $3.60 a gallon, if we assume 5% inflation per year over 40 years, that is from uh, the 60s, uh, 70s, 1970, 2010, um, that would roughly mean prices would have doubled just due to inflation. So if we divide 360 by two, that means that adjusted for inflation, the price of gas is about a dollar eighty a gallon. Now, if we then divide that dollar eighty per gallon by current fleet fuel mileage, which is around twenty-five miles per gallon, it costs us about seven cents per mile to drive a car. If we're able to increase fuel mileage, like with hybrid technology, deep clean diesels, is up to fifty miles per gallon, and divide by that, you can see that driving a, a hybrid or a diesel uh, with high mileage vehicle, the cost of driving today is exactly the same as it was per mile travel in 1970. So technology advances in energy efficiency means that even with higher prices for gas, we're still able to travel the same distance uh, at the same cost today as we were in 1970. So what this results in then is a policy where we're very highly energy consumptive because basically with technology has been a subsidy to allow us to adapt to higher oil prices. And so because of that, we tend to continue to consume lots of petroleum. Now, unlike petroleum, the U.S. has among, the U.S. has not among, but they, are, they have the largest coal reserves of any country in the world. So as we deplete our petroleum, we will have the potential to fall back on coal. And as oil prices uh, rise above, you know, over $100 a barrel, there reaches a tipping point where we can actually convert coal into petroleum at the same price as petroleum. And so as oil prices rise in the future, um, there is the technology available to convert coal into gasoline. Uh, and the Germans, this is nothing new, the Germans did it in World War II at the end of the war when they were forced to do so uh, with, when they lost their oil reserves in South Africa, uh, excuse me, North Africa and in the um, uh, Black Sea region of U the Ukraine and Romania. So uh, as a result, um, we will be able to fall back on coal in the future as an alternative energy source. Of course, the concern here is just like petroleum, it emits, you know, the coal-driven coal gasoline is going to produce additional CO2 just like the petroleum. And this adds to greenhouse gas emissions. There are two ways in which we can mine coal. There's deep mine coal, and in the past that was the primary source of coal. But in more recent times, we have gone to more surface supplies of coal. It's easier to mine. However, it does have different amounts of higher amounts of sulfur compared to the deep mine coal. So there's some trade-offs in terms of 
uh, how easy it is to mine versus the higher sulfur content, which can add to sulfur dioxide uh, and things such as this when the coal is combusted. Well, let's talk a little bit about green energy uh, for a bit. And, and when we green energy, we mean renewable energy, uh, which includes wind, solar, uh, and um, also hydropower and, and uh, geothermal. Uh, so uh, sometimes nuclear power is considered a green energy source, uh, although we can debate that because it does come with it waste disposal costs, things such as this, uh, and is not renewable. So um, we like to think of green energy, because, particularly on these sustainable fronts such as wind, solar, and hydroelectric and geothermal because we can renew those and continuously use them. Now, somebody would argue on the nuclear side and say, well, we have several different types of nuclear reactors and what may be spent fuel from one nuclear reactor can, for example, you can take a conventional reactor and go to a breeder reactor and take the waste product from one and use it as a fuel source in a breeder reactor, um, which is a different type of nuclear reactor. Um, so there are ways you can sort of recycle radioisotopes um, to some extent uh, so that they're not all just spent fuel. Now a study was done by an uh, electric uh, on looking at CO2 emissions from different energy sources. And what we find in this study is that basically your conventional energy sources, oil, uh, petroleum rather, coal and natural gas, have the highest CO2 emissions. You'll also notice that even solar power, wind, and, and uh, nuclear and hydro have some CO2 emissions. Of all of those energies, uh, nuclear power had the lowest CO2 emissions of any of your green energy or renewable energy sources. Now, of all your really what I would consider conventional energy sources that are, make up a large part of our uh, energy production, particularly for electricity, which we showed earlier, um, of your petroleum, natural gas, and coal, and nuclear. Nuclear is clearly the cleanest of those conventional energy sources. Um, now, one of the problems with fossil fuels is that they produce significant amounts of air pollution. The World Health Organization says that some three million people are killed worldwide by outdoor air pollution from vehicle and industrial emissions and indoor from the solid, uh, solid uh, use of fuel another 1.6 million people may be killed due to the burning of, of fuel sources within houses such as uh, natural gas for logs um, and, and he home heating. In the U.S. we estimate 20,000 people die each year due to air pollution complications with asthma, respiratory illness, COPD, and heart disease uh, as a result of fossil fuel combustion. Um, so that is w one of the consequent public health consequences of an energy policy that, that advocates combustion of fossil fuels. Whereas if you take a look at the number of deaths from use of nuclear power, for example, um, we really don't have any hard evidence on how many deaths occur uh, for, as byproducts of nuclear technology. They're certainly very small numbers. Uh, you know, in fact, basically um, uh, numbers that would be you know less than one to ten. I mean, people do die mining the ores that are used uh, to produce uranium and things such as this. So there are some deaths. But uh, overall, uh, that they're minimal compared to what we see here with the fossil fuels. In the future, we really do believe that, um, that nuclear power will have to play a larger role in our uh, energy policy. And uh, if you take a look, the in nuclear in industry is really moving toward what we call modular nuclear power plants. These are nuclear power plants that are about the size of a home garden shed, maybe 10 by 20 by 10, something like that. that that's, here we have a little one in cross section, as you can see here. These types of reactors have been used on nuclear subs for a long time. And they, these modular units can produce enough power to uh, 
provide the electricity for about 20,000 homes. And the U.S. government believes these types of plant power plants will be available in the near future. These are, are sealed in concrete. They contain no weapons grade plutonium or uranium, but rather um, have other isotopes that are less toxic. Um, because they're buried in the ground uh, and encased in concrete, they're virtually impossible to steal. And so, particularly if you have appropriate surveillance, the real game plan is to start to de deploy these energy sources on, on uh, military bases around the U.S. And if we do that, we will reduce our CO2 emissions by about 20 to 30 percent because um, military installations account for that much of our energy consumption from fossil fuels. Um, so uh, if you also think about that by putting it on nuclear, uh, nuclear these modular plants on military bases, you're putting them in secure areas where there would be no potential for uh, any uh, problems with thefts or, or things such as this. Now, the company Hyperion has been given a patent to use to develop this technology with uh, the government has licensed this technology to Hyperion. And these units cost about $25 million each, providing a community of 10,000 households with two per house with electricity. That's a cost of about $2,500 a house, which is really cheap with a life expectancy of 10 to 20 years. Hyperion is owned by Bill Gates, and so in the future, I think you're going to see this technology really starting to, to take off. Now, the Global Humanitarian Forum currently estimates that some 315,000 people die each year due to climate change, and they predict this will rise to nearly 500,000 people by the year 2030. But in addition to causing death, we estimate some 310 people, 10 million people are expected to have suffered ill health by 2030 due to climate change. And nine out of 10 um, of these, uh, of the 90%, that is nine out of 10 cases of morbidity associated with climate change will be in developing nations. As you look at this map and you look at the gray, purple, and um, sort of greenish brown areas where they have high numbers of disability days or this green area for Southeast Asia. You'll notice there in North Africa, the rest of Africa, and in the Southeast Asia Pacific Rim area. Uh, you'll notice the number of disability days in the developed countries like the U.S. and Europe are much, much lower. And the reason for this is these nations that are developed have the resiliency and capacity to adapt to climate change. We do not have that capacity in these other areas of the world uh, that do not have the infrastructure to adapt. Now next I'd like to talk a little bit about liquid biofuels. Liquid biofuels are part of our alternative energy supply, which in the U.S. produces less than 1% of all fuel all energy. Um, but global production has steadily increased from almost a threefold increase in liquid biofuels like ethanol from 2000 to 2007. The liquid biofuels in 2006 contributed 1.8 percent of all total liquid fuels worldwide, but only 0.04 percent of total energy consumption. So again, only a fraction of a percent uh, of overall alternative energies, which comprise about 1% of total energy. So it would be about 4% of, of all energy consumption uh, of the non-conventional sources. By comparison, solid biofuels supply 10 to 13% of the total uh, global energy supply. Uh, so as you can see, clearly uh, uh, the liquid biofuels have a way to go. The goal in the U.S. by 2020 is to produce 70 billion liters of biofuel, and this is equivalent to the worldwide production of biofuels today. So our goal in the U.S. is to ramp our production up to current worldwide levels today. Now, when we talk about biofuels, we have gone through a couple of different uh, transitions. The first generation biofuels included ethanol from corn, 
and then biodiesel from plant oils uh, using both fermentation of sugars for the corn and trans of plant oils for the biodiesel. Second generation biofuels include cellulosic ethanol using not corn but other crops like switchgrass and some other crops uh, which have more cellulose. And then biofuels and, and biomass uh, uh, to liquid fuels from a variety of sources. Uh, for example, algal uh, production uh, to make diesel fuel is an example of an alternative second generation way of making diesel fuel. Uh, it's possible to get as many as 1,200 gallons of diesel fuel per acre, for example, with algal production, which is pretty pr prolific in a pond if we think about it. The problem with algal biofuels is um, they have the potential to offset about half of our current uh, importation of oil uh, from abroad, which would really be a huge help. However, to do that, they, it would require use of nearly five per, over 5% of the land area in the lower 48 states, and we would have to use three times the amount of water used for agriculture. Right now, to make algal but diesel fuel from algae, requires a subsidy of about 1,400 liters per liter of oil diesel fuel produced. Um, by optimizing the locations to where we would be more energy efficient in producing algal diesel, diesel fuel, uh, biodiesel from algae, um, we could get a 75% reduction in that consumption down to about 350 liters of water per liter of oil produced with a 67% reduction in the land area because we're doing the production three-dimensionally in ponds. So again, <clears throat> these advanced biofuels do have the potential to ramp up uh, and meet some of our energy demands and uh, can meet up to 17% of our fuel needs. Um, and that is our goal to, to have these alternative energies doing that so that we reduce our reliance on imported oil. Now if we take a look at where we can actually do algal biofuel production effectively and efficiently because of the water requirements, this rules out a lot of the southwest U.S. and a lot of areas where the environment is arid. The optimum areas are on the Gulf Coast, Southeast Coast, and the uh, Great Lakes states which are, have the am amounts of water needed to do this type of algal biofuel production. You see most of our high water consumptive areas are out west which as I said really means we can't really optimize production in those areas uh, because we just don't have the uh, necessary water in order to do it. Um, this next slide really kind of makes a comparison on water consumption by energy source. You'll notice that for conventional gasoline we use about 0.7 to 0.7 liters of water uh, per kilometer uh, mile driven, um, uh, per kilometer rather driven. Uh, you'll notice if we look at corn ethanol, we go all the way up to 1.4 uh, to 49 liters of water per kilometer driven. Uh, so as we look at some of these others like ethanol from corn, uh, switchgrass is probably the only alternative that we have that has a range of water consumption that sort of is fairly close to what we see with petroleum. So that's why there's a big push to go to really switchgrass and cellulosic ethanol as opposed to ethanol from corn because the water demands are just so high. You'll notice that um, if we look at soy diesel uh, that uses large amounts of water and of course the microalgae um, produce, use large amounts of water as well. So really the only technology we have in terms of water consumption that really falls close to what we have with conventional petroleum is the switchgrass. Um, so um, that really gives you a little bit of an indication of where we are with some of these alternative ways of producing energy. In this last slide, then I would like to kind of wrap up our uh, discussion on energy policy and climate change. And this is a graph on the y-axis. It's a ratio of K 
calories of energy subsidy, uh, that is the amount of energy you have to put to produce food per calorie of food produced. So anytime you're below one, that anytime you're below one, that means you're getting net efficiency. That is, you're pr putting in less energy and getting more energy out. Anytime you're above one, that means you're actually investing more energy than you're getting out in terms of food production. So you really look, if you really begin to look at this graph and look at the activities that really are efficient, is primitive agriculture, hunting, gathering, um, as we see that transition we made some 10,000 years ago to early agriculture, it was highly efficient. And you can see certain crops still remain pretty efficient. Low intensity potatoes, low intensity corn, uh, even modern day rice and soybean production, uh, your wet rice production is still highly efficient. So you can really see that those, act, those technologies really are still effective agriculturally. You'll notice in terms of livestock production, only range-fed range beef, that is cattle eating off of natural prairies, and low-intensity egg production are the only livestock methods that really use less energy than they actually produce more energy than they uh, consume. As you begin to look at uh, activities that are not very energy efficient. Uh, coastal fishing, because of the energy subsidy required to catch the fish, you end up expending more energy than you actually produce. And if you look at distant fishing, you can see you're investing 20 you know, calories of energy per, cal per calorie of food you produce. That's why fishing is just not an activity that we're going to be able to sustain long term. Uh, in my opinion, that's why things like aquaculture and other things really hold great promise for the future. You'll notice that when we move to grass-fed beef, where we actually are cultivating the grass and feeding the cattle, um, that means we're actually investing five times more energy uh, per calorie of food that we produce. And similarly, if we look at feedlot beef, um, we're investing 10 to 20 calories for every calorie of, of beef we produce. So that, as I said earlier, if you really look at, at future policies on food and agriculture, we, we have to really focus on e efficiencies. Uh, and so uh, in closing out, I think that's true in, in agriculture and it's also true in our energy policies. We have to have energy policies that make sense um, that are diverse and, and really I think the real key for energy independence in the future will be a diverse energy policy where we use renewable energies optimized to offset as much of the uh, conventional CO2 emitting fuels um, coupled with a growth in, in nuclear power. We can clearly see if every state in the U.S. were to expand nuclear power like we have in South Carolina, it could be done without uh, adversely affecting health, and that would have a major reduction in our CO2 emissions and greatly reduce um, uh, our reliance on combustion of fossil fuels. The use of these modular nuclear reactors really makes this plausible, and I think we'll begin to see in the next 10 or 15 years some major changes in how energy, our overall energy policy is in the U.S. Climate change is clearly uh, an issue we have to address and because of that we have to be have a keen eye on how we do energy in the future. Well that ends our lecture on energy policy and climate change. That will end lecture three. We'll now uh, in the next video, move on to Lecture 4, which will be the Earth's major ecosystems. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.